Larry and Maya Miliette were high school sweethearts. When they were just 18 years old, they married in 1999 and began raising a family. Together, they had three children and were living in a beautiful home in Chula Vista, California. But after more than 20 years together, they began to have marital trouble. Maya was not happy and was getting ready to leave Larry. But before she could file any paperwork, Maya disappeared on January 7, 2021. She left no note and no clues. This raised a lot of suspicion. Why would a mother of three young children just leave? Maya's husband became the focus of the investigation. And after 21 months, he was charged with Maya's murder, even though her body has never been found. Tonight, Maya's family joins us live to talk about the upcoming trial, the continuing search for Maya, and the battle to see Maya's children. I'm Vinnie Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And if you think back to January 7th of 2021, what were you doing? Do you have any recollection of that day? You may not even know what day of the week it was. Well, you do now. It was Thursday. Um, probably nothing extraordinary happened in your life. Maybe it did. Um, but it's not necessarily a day that, you, that, that would stand out to you. But that day, for three little children in Chula Vista, California, it was the last time they saw their mommy. I want you to think about that for a second. Think about that for a second. What a mother means to a young child. Your mother means everything. Everything. You, you look to your mother for you know, a reason, and, 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 and she's the one that will do anything for you. She is the one who will go to bat for you for the rest of your life. But when you're a little child, you know, you look up and you see mom, and mom is going to take care of you. Now think about that, that loss for these three children, to lose that. That is, that is a gut punch. That is brutal. It, it's cruel beyond anything. I mean, think back to your own childhood, those moments with your, I mean, those memories. And, you know, I think back, I was like a, I remember it was me and my mom, you know, before I ever went off to school every day, every single day, your mom is there. First thing in the morning, last thing at night. She tucks you in, she wakes you up. And for those three children, that's been taken from them. It's not fair, not fair at all. And this is because their mom has been missing. May, Maya, Miliette. She's been gone. Where is she? Knowing her and what I've learned about her since covering this story from the beginning is that there's no way she would voluntarily leave those children. Impossible. Not even up for consideration. So that means something really bad must have happened. It's the only explanation. There is no way that this mom would leave those children. Prosecutors agree. They've charged her husband, her own husband, with her murder. Think about this now, once again. You know, I, unfortunately, we, we cover stories like this way, 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 way too often. But one, to take, and this is the accusation, right? To take the life of your wife, your partner, the one with whom you have brought life into this world. That is outrageous to begin with. But then to rob 
your children of the most important person in their lives. That's what we're talking about in this case. Because Larry Miliette has been charged with the murder of Maya. And here we are. We are tracking this case as we do all the big trials around the nation. And when is it going to happen? What's going on with Larry Miliette? Well, right now there seems to be an issue with his mental competency, right? Which is your, your state of mind right here, right now. Not on January 7th of 2021, but right here, right now. It's been called into question. And as a result, things are moving a little bit more slowly than they normally do in our slow system of justice. But Rachel Bianco from our great affiliate, uh, ABC News 10, out in San Diego, has the latest for us tonight as we all sit here waiting um, for, the, for, for justice, justice for Maya. Here's the story. Larry Miliette could find out next month if doctors think he is mentally fit to stand trial in the murder of his wife, Maya Miliette. Until then, the criminal case is on hold. Maya's sister says every delay makes the loss of Maya even more painful. We wish it can, you know, be done sooner. I mean, it's been a year and a half, you know, for, since my sister been missing. Larry is charged with killing his wife, even though her body has not been found. Maya hasn't been seen since early January of 2021. Larry has denied any involvement in her disappearance. Prosecutors believe he killed the mother of his three children because she wanted a divorce. The trial was supposed to start in June, but Larry's attorney raised doubt about his mental status. Maya's family says that came as a shock. Yeah, he seemed normal, like everything seemed normal for years until this happened. And all of a sudden, he's not capable of speaking or, you know, stepping into trial for something that he did. It's just, it seems like he's back paddling, and now he's trying to protect himself. And it's ridiculous to me. In spite of the charges, Maya's sister says seeing Larry in court doesn't get any easier. It was a family to us, you know, like 20 years he was with the family. So it's really heartbreaking for me to see him. So this issue is one that the court always has to deal with. We're seeing it happen in the case of the doomsday couple. Lori uh, Vallow Daybell was found to be not competent, then was returned to competency. So, and, and we'll talk about the legal aspect of all this in our next hour. Uh, but right now I want to focus on where we are in this case, where the family is, and, and how everyone is holding up. I want to bring in some special guests who've been uh, joining us since the beginning of this case. In Chula Vista, California, uh, Maya Milete's sister, Mary Chris Julier, and her husband, Richard, uh, back with us tonight. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, nice to see you uh, tonight. Um, how are you guys holding up, first of all? It's been really hard, Benny, but um, it's, it's nice to see you, too. But, yeah, it's, um, the family has been... Um, it's been really hard for everybody. Um, not knowing anything at all still, um, you know, but um, we're, we're trying holding on and not giving up, um, still searching for my sister. Um, but we have um, each other and our family to, you know, to hold on and give us strength to, uh, to keep them moving. Absolutely. Um, you know, when the when the charges were first brought, um, uh, I knew that this was the beginning of what would be many times a very long and difficult process on victims' families. It, it always is. It's never easy. So um, I hope they have some victim advocates that from the court system that will help you navigate through this. Um, that's always my hope. What are your thoughts, though, about the accused killer? Okay, That's, he's an accused killer. That's what he is now. Um, the fact that all of a sudden he's mentally not there, allegedly, or not 
acting the way he'd been acting, I guess, throughout his entire life. Um, what are your thoughts there about what you've observed, what you've heard about the status of uh, the accused killer? Yeah, it's tough to uh, to accept that from a family member. Um, knowing him, seeing him outside years from now, I mean, years years ago, uh, he was a great father. I've always we've always said that he was a good father. Um, maybe a terrible husband, but he, I know he loved he loved his kids. He spent time with them, taught them some cool stuff, and all of a sudden, he's not competent enough to face reality. I mean, he planned this. Uh, according to the DAs, he planned this um, really well for months, maybe years. Who knows? Uh, I think ever since they started having the arc, you know, marriage issues, I think that's when he started planning this. Um, he loved her so much, he couldn't let her go, I guess. A, cr a crime of passion. But it's, it's, there's no excuses for what he did. Um, seeing him in court, yeah, it's... It's it's hard for my wife. Um, Does he make eye contact with anyone there, or does he just kind of look straight ahead and talk to his lawyer? Yeah, no, he doesn't make any con eye contact. Um, I I don't think he has any supporters. Uh, uh, I know at the first couple times that we went to court, uh, he had a couple friends there, I guess, and he would make eye contact with them, but he won't make any with us at all. Um, and it's just it, it's it's so it's some it's hard to exp explain like the feeling because you would see him at camp you know go camping or go shooting or do some activities with the family and he was perfectly normal and now it's like it's it's completely different the the level of betrayal that is alleged here is is beyond anything I wanted to put on the screen something because I wanted to talk about the, the children just a little bit. Um, and this was when the, 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 go the government, the prosecution, um, was making a request to deny bail for Larry Miliette. They, they put in their, in their filings that the three children were in the home at the time the defendant murdered his wife on or about January 7th or 8th, 2021. Although he allowed detectives to interview them at the house a few days after May was reported missing, when detectives asked they be brought to Children's Hospital to be interviewed by professionals trained to speak to children, he refused. Um, obviously, red flags when he does that. But at, at this point, as we sit here tonight, um, how are the children? Are, have they been permitted to have contact with their mother's family. Um, yeah, so since um, Larry got into, uh, went to jail, um, we were able to file for a guardianship for the kids. And so we were able to um, get a court uh, uh, a visitation with the kids. So we've been seeing them the first and the third of the month. Um, yeah, and we're so happy about that. Um, but, um, you know, the kids are doing well. Um, unfortunately, with the court order too, um, we're not really allowed to talk about my, my, that much, you know, regarding the kids and um, regarding Absolutely, their absolutely. I just want to make sure they're okay. And, and if they, if you got to spend time with them, Yes. Yeah. Details, not my business. Just wanted to make sure because I, I was extremely concerned about their worlds being completely shut down from anything connected to their mom. And um, Thank you. that's the best news uh, of the day. That's the best news of the day. I want to play for you um, something that was said by uh, the DA in this case. And then I want to ask you about it because it's one of the facts that we learned in this case that I think shocked a lot of people. Um, let's take a listen. Larry was trying to hold on to May and he resorted to uh, contacting what are called spell casters. I've never had a case where that was involved. These spellcasters would be asked to make May want to stay in the relationship. But as December of 2020 came, those messages 
to spellcasters were a lot more threatening. He was asking for May to become incap incapacitated, for May to be in an accident, to have broken bones so that she could stay at home, thus displaying his homicidal ideations to harm May. I'll be honest, I was floored when I heard that. That he was going to a, not just a, I think plural, like spell casters to cast a spell on his wife. Uh, Mary Chris, I I'm wondering your, your thoughts when you found out about that. That was shocking to me too. It was really uh, unbelievable that he had to go through that extent um, to, to hurt my sister and to control her. You know, that, I think that's about it. You know, that's the controlling uh, of him. Um, but that was really, you know, unbelievable that he actually had to go through that. Um, it hurts us to find out um, that he actually went that sort. Um, but, um, I, I, and then to, at, at that point too, I asked myself, like, I don't really know him at that time. Like, I, I don't know who is that Larry. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know that side of him that he is capable of that. It, it's unreal, but it will be, and, and it could be very persuasive evidence uh, during the course of the trial. If you have the, you bring the spellcasters in, I mean, it, it speaks volumes about where his mindset was and, and where his thoughts were at the time. And uh, it could be very important. Uh, Mary, Chris, and Richard are going to stay with us. Um, we've got a lot more to get to in this case, and, it, and there's really two parts to this case. There's the trial, but there is still a missing mom. Um, I mean, there is the search that is ongoing, so we'll deal with that as well. In the meantime, coming up next hour. In Pike County, Ohio, one of the most notorious crimes in the history of the state, the mass execution of eight members of the Roden family. The accused, a rival family fighting for custody of a child. Now, the trial is about to begin, and we're live from Pike County with the latest. They studied the victim's habits and their routines. They knew the layouts of their homes. They knew where they slept. senseless tragedy in small town America. This was a pre-planned execution. It was a feud between families that ended with multiple murders. They came in like thieves in the night and took eight lives. George Wagner faces murder charges in connection with the killer. Wagner's brother and parents also charged. It's very much a family affair. All for one, one for all. It's a chilling story. It will be an intense trial. The Ohio Family Massacre Trial. Live coverage coming soon on Court TV. Was there anybody that wanted to hurt her? Was there any other guy? I hate to ask, but, I, you know. Um, you know, like, I don't know. Uh, I told the police, you know, she really likes hiking. Okay. Um, you know, wine tasting, so Temecula and stuff like that. But I don't know what else to think, like, who would, you know, kidnap her. Or would she go hiking by herself? Um, she has, yes. But that's the one, like, close to the house. We have a hiking trail in San Miguel Park, or San Miguel right here. That's the only time she would go by herself. And yes, she has before in the beginning, um, but she would take her car. So right. she would go to the one, I don't know, the, the Santee one or the one in the Mesa. I, f I forgot there's a mountain there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, yes, those ones she would go by. So, but most of the time she would go with hiking moments uh, with Shane. And then, um, you know, she's like one of the leaders. And then everyone else is like, whoever shows up, shows up to that group. Uh, that was Larry Miliette speaking about his missing wife, May. Um, she's still missing, but he's been charged now with her murder. But before that ever happened, he spoke with KGTV, our, our affiliate out in San Diego. Um, and again, he, he took some time to describe and give his version of what happened uh, in the days leading up to when she went missing. Take a listen. When did you first notice that May was missing? Uh, Saturday morning. Okay. And tell uh, me. Her parents came by. Mm -hmm. Just tell me, kind of walk me through like the last time you saw her and what was going on. Uh, Thursday, Thursday night. Um, 
you know, like we got into a, a, a kind of an argument. Um, and, and, you know, we've been having, uh, you know, like problems, um, you know, for about a year. Kind of like been up and down and stuff like that. But after that, you know, I give her space. So just tell me, so you got into an argument and then um, the last time you saw her was actually in the house? Yes, okay. Thursday. So she yeah. did, she, and she didn't take a vehicle? No. No one saw her leave? Um, no, but on Friday, um, I could still hear her, but I didn't physically see her when I got home. But that's like normal too, because we, you know, we have lots of bedrooms, it's a two-story house, and, you know, we kind of like, well, I give her space. So, but that's why every time someone says um, Thursday, yes, it's physically, you know, or, you know, visually see her. But um, for me, it's uh, Friday, Friday night, you know, I can hear her, like, wrestling around, making dinner for herself in another bedroom. And I'm sleeping with the kids in another bedroom. Okay. So upstairs and she's downstairs kind of deal, like kind of like a roommate um, thing. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like giving each other space. Well, sure. I, I don't need the space. She always wants the space. Got it. So it was like Friday, and then you left or went went somewhere, and then came back, and she wasn't yeah. there, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, I left her with my two girls because they, you know, they um uh, do their homes homeschool, mm-hmm. and then I just had my son with me. So uh, when I came back, she was still there on Friday. Um, we can hear her downstairs, you know, like after I'm done giving the kids bath and feeding them and everything, and. Um, on Saturday morning, uh, when her parents came came by, uh, her door was locked. Uh, I found the keys to the bedroom, and I opened it, and she was already gone. So it kind of maybe she went through a morning sunrise hike. Now, um, that's his story, and I think that'll have to be his story at trial unless there's some other defense that they uh, bring forth. I mean, this is what he's saying at the time that uh, May is reported missing. But what was really going on inside that inside that home and in that relationship? I want to bring back in our special guests, uh, May's sister, Mary Chris, and brother-in-law, Richard. Um, what can you tell us um, about the status of their relationship at the time that May went missing? Um, as he, you know, Larry admitted it himself, you know, that they've been having marital you know, issues for a year. Um, so... Um, it's been up and down uh, for the last, you know, maybe a few years before that too. Um, but it just got worse in uh, 2020. Um, but um, uh, I, you know, um, they they we we don't usually go to their house, but they, you know, we always have parties and they at least we see each other almost every other um, every month, I would say. And um, we with that the relationship we. Sometimes we can tell they're having some arguments or they have, you know, they're fighting and, um, you know, sometimes they're okay. Um, so you could actually tell there's a, they've been having marital issues. They've been having problems. Um, but um, um, I, I just um, didn't uh, imagine that. It was that bad. Um, my sister um, had, quite hide it from us you know from her family because then again she didn't really want us to worry about you know her side or her issues or her problem um so she didn't really open up as much as i wish she could have you know to us but um you could actually tell they're having they're having problems now that weekend was an important weekend, wasn't it? It, it, it? You know, it's not a weekend where she's gonna take some casual trip somewhere or, you know, after a fight with Larry, uh, just, you know, storm off. I mean, that was, there was a big weekend coming up. What can you tell us about that weekend? Um, what you observed, other members of your family uh, may have seen or heard? Correct, yeah. So that weekend, as actually, she planned a birthday party for her daughter. Uh, that Sunday is her daughter's 10th birthday, and we plan to, we were going for a snowboarding trip up in Big Bear here in, in, in California, and, um, you know, she was planning for it. Uh, we, all, we are all looking forward to going and um, having a, a good party and celebrating her daughter's birthday. So 
um, for her to just leave early Saturday morning is not her because their plan was to leave Friday night uh, to go up in Big Bear. So um, his story doesn't really match up of what he was saying on what was planned for that weekend. This was a big deal. This was like the family was getting together and, you know, daughter's birth. And you're not going to leave then. That, to me, that makes no sense whatsoever. Um, Richard, were there any conversations you had with him at the point that, uh, that May was missing? Uh, I didn't really talk to him. I didn't really open up. He didn't open up to our conversations as most men do um, or don't do. We kind of just talked about stuff that we like, fishing and camping and other activities. Um, but about the relationships, we never really talked about relationships. Like, I don't know. How about I mean. after the moment that, okay, now May is missing and everyone's wondering where she is, everyone's looking for her, everyone is desperate. Did you have any conversations with him in that that point of of time um saturday when we, when we showed up i i asked him what happened and he just kept to himself saying i don't know she's not here and i that's when i just kind of like i was kind of huddling around my wife because she was very emotional at the time my sister's missing we got to call the cops and I'm like, Larry, we should call the cops. I mean, he's, uh, we did call the cops, and they told us to call the churches, call the hospitals, call any women retreat uh, centers. And I said, you okay, uh, I'll start calling the churches. She started calling any hospitals. And Larry just, I'm like, you should call. He's like, no, you guys are overreacting. I'm like, dude, your, your wife's missing. I got do something, you know, react. You can't be neutral during a, a situation like this. And he was. And that was pretty much our only conversation we had. Uh, Sunday, we I was out with the family, my brother-in-laws, passing out flyers with the community. Some friends showed up, started helping us out, passing out flowers and, uh, flyers and Going door asking to door. door to door, asking people if they've seen anything on their, on their rings, on the um, video. Um, video cameras, security cameras. And uh, Larry just stood home. He just kind of like huddled around the kids. He didn't want incredibly, to incredibly revealing. Yeah. The, the mother of your children's missing. Your wife. You've been together for years. She's missing. And oh yeah, they'll take care. They'll they'll look for her. I'm just gonna stay here. Unbelievable. Right. Okay. Uh, Mary, Chris, and Richard are gonna stay with us when we come back. As I said, there's two parts of the story, and we're gonna get into now the search for uh, May Miliette because you at home may very well have some information that could help as well. Uh, so we'll talk about that when we come back. And off your purchase. If I That's Maya Miliete uh, singing. I posted a bunch of videos uh, online that we got to enjoy. Um, she's missing and has not been found. Her husband's been charged with her murder. Uh, but they still have not recovered Maya. So I want to go through a little bit of the timeline of what is alleged by prosecutors in this case to have a better idea of the search efforts and, and where they should be and where she could possibly be. Um, let's begin here on January 7th, 2021, 1215 p.m. in the afternoon, May makes an appointment with a divorce attorney. 815 that night, May sends last known communication to family via Facebook Messenger. Then we move on to the next day, January 8th, 558 a.m. Larry is seen on surveillance video repositioning his Lexus in the driveway. 47 minutes later, 6.45, Larry leaves the house for 11 hours. He takes his four-year-old child with him and leaves the older children at home. Home, alone. 
339, Larry enters his home address into his vehicle navigation system and then returns home at 6.06 p.m. Let's get back, though, to the part with the driveway and the Lexus. Here, again, is the DA talking about that. Security video brought by, retained by Chula Vista PD showed the defendant on January 8th at 5.58 a.m. in the morning moving his Lexus GX460, a black Lexus, with the license plate that bears the name Melani. The Lexus was already backed into the driveway, but Larry Miliette repositioned that Lexus where the back of the Lexus is in, in the entrance of that garage. He repositioned it where no video camera can capture whether a body was put in the back of the Lexus or not. Still with us tonight, Maya's sister, uh, Mary Chris, and brother-in-law Richard, and joining us now in Charleston, South Carolina, former homicide detective and host of The Interview Room with Chris McDonough. Chris McDonough is with us. And in Chicago, Illinois, private investigator Erica Morse. Welcome to everyone. Uh, Chris, I want to begin with you. Um, your thoughts about finding May. Where should we be looking? How difficult is this? What evidence points you in what direction here? You know, uh, thanks, Benny, for uh, having me tonight. And uh, so I think the timeline here has been obviously critical from day one. And what's very interesting in Larry's behavior is the fact that he's been able to uh, manipulate one particular move ahead of the other. Uh, and he was adapting, in my opinion, you know, through this particular case. So I know that Richard and uh, Mary Chris have been searching from day one. Uh, in fact, I think they've even been certified uh, by some professionals uh, as a search and rescue team. And the timeline in of itself, uh, they had to start with what the vehicle information would say. Uh, and so that's a critical, you know, couple of hours in there. So, you know, he's got that distance uh, potentially in there. So it, at this point, you know, it is so difficult to narrow down exactly where he was at that point. Uh, and so, so some of the forensic cell tower information uh, was also going to be critical uh, behind the house there. Erica Morse, I know you've worked so many cases like this someone is missing uh what are your thoughts tonight about finding my hi mary chris and richard sorry we keep a meeting like this guys um you're doing everything right keep doing it um there were a couple things that i picked up on uh some areas that you may want to look and one of them is in relation to this GPS that he put in at 3.29 p.m. to come home. And it was about a two and a half hour trip. I don't think he went as far as San Diego. I don't think he went up to Solana Beach. I don't think he did. Um, there's a property in Murrieta. I don't know if I'm saying that right, um, but that property was actually vacant in 2021. And there's also some land around it. It looks like maybe some hiking trails around it. Uh, that is an area that is known to him that he would be very familiar with. And if that property and that area has not been searched, I'd be taking a serious look at that. I think you know the property I'm referring to. Right. Yeah. I, I yeah. know exactly what you're referring to. And then uh, we did kind of went kind of like recon the area too. Um, but uh, we just um, thought it wouldn't be a possibility because then now it's very crowded in that area, but then we can probably look, go back and look again in there. I'm, I'll reach out to you because um, there's some real estate information you'll need to see about the timing of when that property was vacant, and that's why I'm, I'm kind of leaning in that direction right now. Just rule it in or rule it out um, would be my advice. And then um, also there was, uh, there was one more area um 
I am so sorry. I just I just lost that area. I'll I'll email you the information. We'll get it over to you. But I really want that area checked. And then, um, you know, the other thing is you do not have to keep going to every one of these hearings because I know it's wearing you down. And I know that you're making a two hour drive for a five minute hearing in order to get another delay and get another delay. You don't have to put yourself to, through that. You know, trial could be months away, trial could be years away, depending on what the judge decides in this competency situation. So just keep focusing on finding Maya because when you find her, there's going to be a whole slew of new evidence that is only going to strengthen this case. Um, there are some search organizations that we may need to put you in contact with, especially because of the vast area you're searching. Texas EquiSearch, Laura Recovery Center, um, even Adventures with Purpose, who has done amazing work lately with water searches. Um, so let's get you in contact with some more because I noticed that your searchers are still being trained to learn new areas and learn new train or new search techniques. And so we want to make sure that you have all those tools to conduct a thorough search and cover every type of terrain. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're all right, much. all our guests are gonna stay where they are. We've got more to cover here. Um, once again, um, the search for Maya continues. Yes, there's a trial, yes, there are charges, but she still has not been found. Also, coming up next hour. In Miami, Florida, Instagram and OnlyFans model Courtney Clenny extradited back to Florida, charged with the murder of her boyfriend, getting ready for her next court appearance and trying to get released from custody. Should she be granted bond? Our think tank weighs in. Evidence gathered during the investigation of Christian's death showed that since November of 2020, he and the defendant Clenny had been involved in an extremely tempestuous and combative relationship. The report generated from the download indicates a navigation event on January 8th at 3.29 p.m. in the afternoon. For Larry's home address, 2413 Paseo Los Gatos. So two and a half hours before returning to the home, he is entering his home address to get to the home. And this is why I am giving this information so the public understands that we do not have a vicinity where the body may be. The, it may be out two and a half hours or even further or closer. And that's why we need the public's help. One of the key parts of this case, uh, where was he? What was he doing? Why did he have to punch in uh, the GPS and then two and a half hours later get home? Um, and meanwhile, 11 hours away from home, leaving two young children by themselves? Doesn't make sense. I want to show you a quick map here of, of some of the areas that are mentioned in all of this. Uh, first of all, we begin at, at, at the home of um, Larry and Maya's house in Chula Vista. Again, uh, Larry telling police he left his house at 6.45 a.m. with his four-year-old. Um, he said he went to Solano Beach. Let's show you where that is. Uh, he went to Solano Beach all day. That is 35 miles northwest of their home, but... When investigators showed him a map, he pointed to Torrey Pines State Beach, which is 4.2 miles south of Solana Beach. So maybe he got confused or maybe he's not telling the truth, right? Um, here's, I think, the most significant part of all of this, right? Weather reports for Torrey Pines Beach on January 8th, 2021, between 50 and 63 degrees and foggy. Come on. Come on. Let's bring back in our guests. Uh, Maya's uh, sister and a brother-in-law, Mary Chris Richard, with us. Chris McDonough and Erica Morse uh, also with us. Chris, the, the weather between 50 and 63 degrees and foggy. Come on. Come on. We're going to yeah. the beach to hang out? That's ridiculous. Yeah, exactly, Vinny. I mean, we've, you know, I did, that was my career, Southern California and that area. I mean, that was, that was my stomping ground. And that early in the morning, and and my love to Richard and Mary Chris, by the way, before I 
get, forget. Uh, you know, that early in the morning, you know, forget it. And, you know, one other interesting piece of this, not only does he type into his GPS, you know, his home address, but we have to think about his mindset at the time. You know, he doesn't know really where he's at because he's getting directions on how to get home. So that should be taken into consideration in what we would call a geographic profiling uh, to figure out, you know, that, that range of two and a half hours out from his residence. Well, he doesn't know how to get back home. So wherever he was that type that in um, is, is, is a mystery at this point. Yeah, Erica, that's one of, you know, it's one of the, the, the few clues uh, that we have relative to all this. Um, he's in some place, I mean, it, it could be in some area where there's just no landmarks or you don't know where you are. I don't know that part of the country that well, um, but to me, that is, that's an important part of all this. It is. It is. And because you're looking at such a vast area, um, there are two resources that I think will really help moving forward, especially this time of year. Um, number one, you're in hunting season um, in California, and you want to make sure that every hunting organization out there, whether it be bow and archer, whether it be rifle, whatever, um, knows about Maya's disappearance, has her flyer, has a, a description of any jewelry that she may have always worn because believe it or not hunters this time of year help us find a lot of missing people um second um, if you're not familiar with NamUs, the National Missing and Unidentified System, um, I did some digging through it this afternoon, and I would encourage you and your advocates to do some statewide searches and expand that into Nevada and some other um, some other areas, some other states um, surrounding California. You also cannot rule out Mexico. Um, I don't know. There's not been a lot of talk about whether or not he had a passport, whether or not there had been any travel previously into Mexico, but just based based on, on Chula Vista's location, um, that cannot be ruled out. So I think that we can use a combination of some online databases and some technical tools, along with just those searchers to really kind of expand that, because you really are looking for a needle in a haystack right now. And take it from somebody who's been there, it's not easy, it will drive you crazy, and you just need all the support you can get. So Mary, Chris, we, we know how significant it would be for the investigation and the trial. I think they can prove it as is, but obviously the case becomes infinitely stronger with that type of evidence. But how important is it for you and your family? It will mean the world to us to find our sister. That's all it is. Yeah. That's what we're asking for, just to bring her back home bring her back to us, her family, her kids. That's all that matters to us. It, to be honest, yeah, I don't even care whatever happened to to Larry. That's, we just want our sister back home. That's all we want. It's very important for the whole entire family. So instead, I'm just going to take this opportunity to ask the public, please, still help us find my sister. Let us bring her back home, please. Uh, Mary, Chris, I know how difficult this is for you. Um, and I, I appreciate you coming on and I know Maya is thinking of it, but I also know that you two together um, and Richard, you know, providing such, you know, we can see it. I mean, we see it anytime you come on, that strength uh, is so important and, and Richard, um, uh, you and Mary Chris have just been amazing advocates uh, for May and for each other and representing your family so well. And we Thank wish you, you the best. We'll stay in contact, obviously. And again, folks, if you have any information, please, please, please pick up the phone, whatever. Even if you don't think it's significant, uh, make that call. Uh, Chris McDonough, host of The Interview Room with Chris McDonough. Make sure you watch it, download it. Erica Morris. Always great to have you, your experience, and your compassion as well. Thank you all so much. Um, we'll be back.